uh, questions and answers will be a very nice topic. For I, have, I have one question. Okay. Uh, okay. We're going to start with the first question. Sure. We, we, we read this week's Pedashah that the, you know, there was a donkey and the donkey spoke. And I don't have a problem with the donkey speaking. I saw many donkeys speaking <laughs> in my life. So my question to you is, the, all the other, you know, they call themselves Orthodox, but they're more modern Orthodox. They have a very big issue with this donkey speaking because they say donkeys don't speak. So they go out of the way to say that the donkey didn't speak. Now, I'm not, I, I wasn't there. I, I know the rabbis say it did speak, it didn't speak. To me, it doesn't matter. To me, this is something that is, is a miracle. But why is it that these types of people have such a big issue with the donkey speaking? And is there something that takes away from Hashem if you say that maybe that Hashem didn't do these open miracles in public? So, it's a wonderful question. Many people rather to throw um, Hashem it barach outside of the picture and to run their life like there is no creator that can change nature completely and that can make wonders and miracles for them in their life because it makes their life more simple and they feel less obligated to serve him and to commit themselves to him. It can be a very nice hobby. From now on, I'll be religious, I'll keep uh, Shabbat, as I want to keep Shabbat, I'll eat kosher when it's comfortable for me to eat kosher. Like, there is no one that is standing in front of me and, and telling me what to do. So it makes your life easier. The problem is that it's not true. So those people are basically lying to themselves because we saw so many times in life that our prayer changed nature and we saw wonders and miracles and, and, and huge things against nature that you don't have no explanation except of knowing that there is only one creator that loves us so much and care about us so much and able to open the sea for us to grow, to cross in, in dry land in the middle of the sea. And things like that that happened with our nation and every person can tell his own story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim like I told you, I saw many donkeys speaking, speaking in television, speaking in many places. Like donkeys? <laughs> it's not a problem to see donkeys speak. So I don't know. I don't understand what's so hard on uh, believing in that. Okay, now it's your turn. We're going to go this way, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't go that way. Kadima. You're shy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not ready. We need a topic, you know. Okay, a topic. Okay, so let's ask a question. I'll ask you a question. Let's say that Mashiach will be... Just a question, random question that came into my mind. Let's say that Mashiach will be a Hasid Belz, a Belzer Hasid, okay? I'm asking you another question. What will happen to all of his Hasidim? The closest ones to him, the friends that learned with him in yeshiva, are they going to be humble? Will they be able to be Hasidim of Mashiach and to follow him? Or that the fact that their best friend or their Rebbe become Mashiach? Let's say that Mashiach will be Sfaradi or Ashkenazi or Temani. What will happen to that group that Mashiach will come out of it? Will they be able to accept face of Mashiach or that they will be the first one to be rejected because to accept Mashiach it's to be humble. You I'm cannot... sorry, can I ask you a quick question? What like, exactly happens to Mashiach? We chose the topic and now it's time for questions. What? Yes. <laughs> no, I'm saying like, okay, when Mashiach comes, I'll what happens? Exactly what? what happens when he comes? Like, what's gonna... Mashiach, yeah, when he comes? comes tomorrow. We want to know that. That's a good question. Okay. Yeah, you know, like, what, 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 you know, what's so a few things are, are, are happening. It's a process. It's written that there will be 40 years of Mashiach, first of all. And I heard some righteous people that said that those 40, days, uh, 40 years already started. I don't know how you, how you see it and, and how to measure and when to know that it started. But there are many people that said that it already started. And in those 40 years, if it started or if not, 
people will still do tshuva. People will still have the opportunity and the ability to come closer and closer to Hashem. It's going to be years of awakeness. But after the, those 40 years of hard work and labor of Mashiach working on, on bringing people to do tshuva, the gates of tshuva will be closed and sealed. And then no one from that moment and on can do tshuva anymore. And that's a very, very hard situation for yeah, us. That's a problem. Yeah. I'll tell you why it's not fair. Because let's say somebody gets religious when he's 25. He's very close. He wants, but he hasn't accomplished yet. He hasn't gotten there yet. When you have someone else who got religious at 25, and right. 40, it must be upcoming. And that guy doesn't have the same chance as a 40 year old. Right. That's why I'm so happy that I haven't seen Mashiach yet and that Mashiach didn't came yet. And I'm very happy and very glad because that's exactly what we're talking about. Now we have the opportunity to do as much as we can and to bring as many as we can into people, be, into the gates of Shiva. If he comes tomorrow, we don't go to work, everyone's taking off. No. <laughs> what happens? Everyone's taking it, I'm asking you. I want to know. You know, he's here, let's go. It depends if if Mashiach. It depends. It depends if Mashiach might be your boss. So then, for sure, you're going to come to work. But we don't know who Mashiach will be. But it's written, Olam kemin hagonuheg, that the world will continue as it is, but with spiritual developments. Like things will start move in in a brighter way, in a nicer way. Um, wealthier and, and healthier and stronger and wiser and, and with more patience and stuff. But still, um, the world will continue. So, where were we? And that coincides with Tefiyat Mithim, Mashiach. So when Mashiach will come, so after 40 years of Mashiach, there will be that day that was Judgment Day. And in that Judgment Day, everyone will be judged. And when there are judgments, there are no mercy, no chesed anymore, no kindness anymore, and you cannot do tshuva. This is why we're very happy that Mashiach didn't came, come yet, and we are doing the best that we can to bring as many people as we can into the gates of tshuva. No, it's a person. You, you'll have the merit to shake his hand and... and Probably gonna get a huge hug from him. So He's gonna like him. <laughs> he doesn't hug trees. You can be hugged. He doesn't hug trees. So how do you fulfill the obligation to yearn for Mashiach every day if you're saying that we should want to be doing this with that? So I'll tell you a story that happened with me. Is it okay by you? I'll tell you a story that happened to me. Once, there, maybe six, seven years ago, there was a um, crazy situation in the Holy Land that um, the Palestinians were shooting rockets and, 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 and all of that mess into, into our um, villages, into our cities. And uh, in one of the nights I went, it was a very hard time, many people were killed in those days. And me, in those days, I was doing many times six hours in Bodadut at night. I was helping my wife to put the kids to sleep, and then I would go at night, 9 a.m., 9, 9 p.m., 10 p.m., go to the fields, to the forest, to wherever, many times to graves of tzaddikim. And in that night, I went to a grave of a righteous man that his name is Rabbi Yudha Ze'ev Lebovich. Rabbi Yudha Ze'ev. Lebovich, that he buried in um, Bet Almin in Bnei Brak, and over there close to the Chazonish. And over there I was doing my hit bodedut, and I was crying, and I was calling Hashem, please Hashem, help Am Yisrael, that we won't have uh, people dying so much, and help us, and I tried to cancel judgments as much as I, I, I could with my prayers, with my tefillot, with my bodedut. And Suddenly it came to me that there is something wrong with my attitude. I felt that Hashem Barach, He can do such hard things to us, and how can it be that I let Him do something so wrong, Hashem? And that thought was very, it was frightening me. Like, who are you to say that Hashem is doing something wrong? But I still, I felt like, 
people are dying, so something is wrong and Hashem is on top of everything in the world, so what's going on? And then I, I felt like that is the prayer that Hashem is giving me. And I, I felt like going and, and, and arguing with Him. And I did it. I felt like that will be my bodhidut of tonight. And I dared. And I was very, like you say in Hebrew, chatsuf, rude. And I was fighting with Hashem completely. I put all of my powers on that. I told Him, you can't do that anymore. It's not fair. It's not right. People are sacrificing themselves for you. And I was arguing. I was fighting with Him. All the way and exhausted, I went back home. In the next day, a righteous man that his name is Rabbi Aaron Stern, the son of Rabbi Alter David Chaim Stern from Bnei Brak, a very righteous and very famous rabbi, called me and he told me, I want you please to... We had a certain meeting in that night and we had a conversation. And in the end of that conversation and my prayers in that night, in the next day he called me and told me, I want you please to call your rabbi and tell him, tell him that you stopped, you canceled a huge decree. So I didn't, I didn't know, but okay, so you, can you tell me about it? I asked him over the phone. He said, from heaven, there was a huge judgment, something very dangerous that was about to happen to Am Yisrael. And you, with your tefillot and with your attitude, with your approach, you canceled that decree. And then he said, and Mashiach was about to come in that Sukkot, and you stopped him from coming. So, I didn't know anything about it. It wasn't my intention. I never thought about it. Mashiach didn't cross my mind while I was praying and doing my videos. And that is what the, that righteous man decided to tell me. I didn't call him, I didn't ask him what was the effect of my prayers. That's a phone call that I received from him in the next day. So, look at what that goes on. When Mashiach is coming, so Mashiach is a huge light. And when there is a huge light on something, it reveals, it brings out all of the defects, all of the problems. And then judgments and angers are waking up on the lackings. So then people become guilty. And they're not really so guilty, just the fact that Mashiach is already in the gates of Jerusalem makes them guilty. The fact that the Geula is here, that Mashiach is here, that Bet HaMikdash is here, that everything is pure, suddenly you become so impure, so contaminated. And we don't want that. We want to keep on working on ourselves. So when I was arguing and fighting and trying to cancel the judgments, what that it did was to reject that aspect that caused Mashiach in a way. I don't know what happened in that night. I don't have no clue, no understanding. I don't have those hasagot, high uh, spiritual understandings to see those things. I haven't experienced that. I just heard what that person told me. If it brings some light to your questions, we do need to want the redemption to come. We do need to see the Mgiula is coming, but we're not allowed to give up on our brothers as long as we do that. There is an amazing story that I'm going to tell you now about that issue of Mashiach. There was a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Mordechai Mitchernobyl. Rabbi Mordechai Mitchernobyl once came out very late in Shabbat from his room, from his office, and he was late in more than one hour, one hour and a half to, for lunch, for Sudash second meal in Shabbat. And his students couldn't understand why he was so late. And then they, he came out and he explained to them. He told them, he told all of his students, for sure, you can understand there was a very important big reason why I came out very late. And I'll tell you the reason. Um, Eliyahu and Avi came to me, to him, to Rab Mordechai Chernobyl, and told me that all of the holy princes of Am Israel, the head of the tribes, they decided together to bring Mashiach and that King David and Moshe Rabbeinu and all of the leaders of Am Israel accepted that. And you're the last one, Rab Mordechai Mitchernobyl, to agree on that, that in this Motzei Shabbat, Mashiach will come and the Geulah Shlema will be. 
So I was, and that's what Rav Mordechai Mishra Nobel is saying, so I was arguing with him until I claimed some good claims, some good arguments I gave him, and I convinced him to cancel that decree, and I refused to sign, and thank God Mashiach will not going to come in Motzei Shabbat. So it's written over there in that book that I read, a book that calls Zichronam Livracha, that the students couldn't understand what he was talking about. How can it be? What? You're stopping Mashiach. We want Mashiach to come. Everyone wants Mashiach to come. But his children, they, they understood. And then one of the students asked him, how can it be that you said that Mashiach is not supposed to come? So he said, look, when Mashiach will come, many judgments will wake up, like what did I explain to you right now. Many judgments will come, and many people of our nation will be rejected and I wanted to cancel that decree. So that student asked him another question. He told him, I'm sorry, I don't want to argue with you. I'm just asking. But let's say that big judgments will come and many people will die, but at least we'll have an end to the sorrow, to the exile. We're going to achieve the complete redemption. So, okay, some people will suffer, but the rest will be redeemed finally. Now everyone are suffering. So Rabbi Mordechai looked at him and asked him, and how do you know, from where do you know that you will be from those ones that will be redeemed? You're saying that some people will be rejected. Do you know how many will left? Maybe only 10. You don't know the number. You can't describe the circle. You can never know where Hashem Ibrahim will put that border between the Kedushah, Kedushim, the holy people, the one with the merit, to the rest of the people. So, because we don't know, and because that we heard that Hashem Barach said that verse, Shelo idach mimenu nidach, that he wants to bring a redemption that no one will be left behind, no one will be left behind, so we're following that shita. And we're trying to bring everyone to complete their tshuva before days of Mashiach. Everyone, even the last one. How we, Baalet Tshuva, people like me, people like us, at all woke up in tshuva. We were doing drugs, we were dancing in clubs, we were smoking, breaking Shabbat, drinking, doing everything. And so Hashem uh, Barach suddenly decides to wake you up, shake your, your heart and your mind and your soul in the middle of a party or in an after party or in a later event. And, and, and suddenly he wakes you up and calls you to serve him. And, and, and then you do. And then you check yourself. Why Hashem woke me up? Because I was so righteous? No. I was wearing leather leather pants while I was dancing. No one was righteous. No tzitzit over the tequila and, 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 and rum and coke. And coke. So you can't do tshuva from those places. But Hashem Barach decides to wake you up. So if Hashem Barach decides to wake you up, it means that He reveals His kindness. It's not because that you're so righteous. So if Hashem woke you up because that He's so kind, and you were zero, you were under zero, you had horrible debts. So it means that everyone got that same opportunity to do tshuva and to come back to Hashem. And we just need Him to reveal His loving kindness. That's the only thing. The one that uh, was sitting over there, he escaped. <laughs> Please, it's your turn now. Great. One very powerful viral video on YouTube is enough. One crazy video on YouTube will do the change completely. One viral, strong, crazy, powerful on Facebook will change the face of the universe for good. I have students from Nab Namibia, from Jordan, from Pakistan, from Kazakhstan, from four wings of the universe. I even have students from Jersey. You won't believe it. I have so many students and they're all waking up from weird places and everyone wakes up and everyone finds Judaism inside of him. I have students that are not Jewish 
that are screaming from inside telling me I have a Jewish soul. I don't know what to do with myself. I want to put filin. I want to keep Shabbat. I want my children to learn Torah. And you're talking about an, an African person, a Goy, non-Jew, that in his village, in, in their place, there are no Jews at all. And they're doing whatever they can. A student from Africa sent me a question a few days ago. We want to have a Sefer Torah in our place of prayer and we can afford only a disqualified Sefer Torah. Are we allowed to buy it and to use it? They're non-Jews and they want to read in the Torah in Shabbat and they want to be observant and to keep all Torah and mitzvot. And like, what's going on here? How, how, how can it be? That's what Hashem is doing. We don't need to do much. It will take what that Hashem will decide to do to make that change happen. And until then, we just need to do as much as we can to have part in the Geulah. The Geulah is a promise. It's a guarantee. It will happen. It will come. The only question is if we will have a part in it and what will be our share. Yes, yes. You're all so shy. But it's your time now to ask me questions. <laughs> this man has the best questions. But then we open it and the best questions. I can take the camera to expose me. What made you say, wow, I need to change my life? Myself, my life, my... That spiritual awakening. Okay, so... Uh, Thank God I, was not on, I wasn't on acid or something like that when it happened. I was in the army, I was a soldier. And um, many, student, many friends of mine over there, um, while I was serving in the army, were talking to me about God, were asking me questions about uh, faith. What do you think? Maybe there is a shame. Like people, traditional families and stuff. And I was very secular with my spikes and my bright blue Oakley sun sunglasses. Uh, I like, uh, didn't care about anything. And just all those people were coming and talking to me and trying to ask me, what do I think? And whatever, friends. And their questions were very interesting for me. I really took them seriously. And I was honest enough to say, it's an option. Even though that I never experienced that spiritual spirituality, spiritual aspect of a creator in my life, I didn't disqualify that and I was ready to hear and I had many many conversations with them and those things woke me up and I remember that there was a day a friend told me um, it's written you know religious people usually quotes from the Torah from verses and one day um, it crossed my mind that uh, what's the difference between me and a Haredi person, a very observant person. What's the difference between us? We both Jewish. He is just learning Torah, and I'm not. That's the only difference between us. I also have a Torah Chumash in my house. I had Tanakh. Every person that finished uh, basic trainings in the in the army, he received the, the Bible, the Tanakh. I had Tanakh in my house. I just I couldn't care less about it. And that from person. All day long he wants to see and to learn more and other books and uh, more mefarshim on that book's explanation. And that's, that's the difference. So I said to myself, you know what, maybe you will read the Bible. Every secular person allowed to, to read the Bible. It's okay. It's not, a, it's not a sin. So I decided to read the Bible. And I was going like that with the Bible like a person that reads a regular book. I just put my heart into it and I was really trying to understand the meaning of the verses and it woke me up big time. The verses, it was the best book I ever read in my life. It was fascinating. And um, one of those days I went with a very strong thought about Hashem Barach in my mind. And suddenly, while I was thinking if Hashem is exist or not exist, if like I was wondering something in my mind and that person walks in front of me in the same path and he said, hey, you know, and he answered to my question. I had that question in my mind. And in that private supervision, Hashem Yitbach made that person to come and to answer my question, the question that I had in my thoughts. I haven't revealed it to him and he answered it to him. And in that day I saw the most clear personal supervision on, on myself and I realized that there is a creator. 
And that moment really changed my life to understand that there is a supervision, a supervisor, someone on top, behind the curtain, someone hidden. And I, I took it very seriously and I moved forward with keeping to home and sort as much as I could. Yeah. Right, so before that, you didn't, you didn't really believe that there was a creator? If you would ask me, I would answer to you that I know that there is no, but I know that there is no creator. No. I didn't believe oh, in no. creator at all, but so I, you, but I really never thought do, about do it. I would that just it's answer. It's harder for uh, someone to do teshuvah if they go from not believing that there's a creator at all to all of a sudden having a revela revelation that there is, versus a person that always believes that in Hashem, his whole life. That's no, the, those are the yeah, hardest we, cases. Yeah. <laughs> Needs medicines for those, I think. Needs a lot of medicines. Because medicine. I think most, <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I'm going to speak for, for myself, but I think most, most of my circle, I would say the level of Imunah maybe is not, you know, 100%, but everyone, everyone more or less, if, if we had to bet, is there Hashem, everyone's going to put all the money on Hashem. The, the, that yeah. is Hashem. Yeah. So for us, maybe... It's not as uh, easy to, to have that epiphany where, oh my gosh, there's, you know, there's Hashem yeah. Yitvara, because we already know that Hashem exists. Yeah, I understand your question. Epiphany. And I, I had, a, I had, he's still my friend, a friend of mine that lives in, uh, in Miami. And um, he was one of the first ones that helped me to do tshuva. He was talking to me a lot about that. He came from a religious family, but he wasn't so observant, but he was putting tefillin and trying to keep Shabbat as much as he can, whatever. And um, and we were talking a lot, and in one of the days, of my early days of my tshuva, he came with that question, and he told me, how can it be that you have such spiritual uh, um, experiences, and me, that I'm putting tefillin since I was 13, I don't feel anything. And for you, Shabbat is so, so amazing and inspiring. And I, my Shabbatot are gray and dry and I don't feel anything. So I think that the solution is, is the same for both, pe bo both cases, both kinds of people. Just that it's a little bit more far from the ones that grew up in religious houses. And I'll tell you the solution, and I'll tell you why it's harder for them. The solution is the private, individual, personal conversation with Hashem. What did we, as the Breslev, call it? Bodedut. When you do it, Bodedut, when you talk to Hashem Barach like you talk to your best friend, you just call him, Hi, how are you? What's going on? I need your help. Please, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. Please, my wife, my children, my friends, my parnasa, my money, my truck. Please, Hashem, my business, what's going on? My health, whatever. When you talk to him like that, you feel closeness to him. When you talk to him, you feel the warmth, you feel the love, you feel the connection. When you're mute, when you're not able to talk to him, so then you feel distance, like your friends, your best friend. It's the one that you're in touch with him the most. And the one that you're not in touch with him, it's because you're not, so, you're not friends so much. You're not so much... You're not in touch. So also with Hashem, the connection depends in power of speech, in the conversation. Also with your wife, also with your children. Your connection depends in how much you talk, how much you speak. So the, that's the solution. And everyone that will take that advice and will just go every day for five minutes, for ten minutes, for an hour, and will talk to Hashem, he will feel the presence of Hashem. He will feel godliness. He will feel light. He will feel warmth. He will feel support. He will feel love. He will feel that there is someone to talk to. There is someone that listens, that accepts and answers your prayers. He will feel it. Everyone that will pray will feel it. The problem with the religious people, the one that grew up in religious houses, is that someone put a siddur in their book when they were children and told them, pray, 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 pray. And now they're stuck with the siddur and they call it tefillah, prayer. And that's it. And they don't know what to do. They don't have no communication with Hashem. They don't have no understanding. They don't have no connection. It's a, the reading. They will receive A plus on reading in Judgment Day. Amazing. You read the Siddur so many times and amazing. And 
אז לבעלי תשובה, after one hour that you hold the סידור in the בית כנסת, someone comes and tells you, hey, you hold it upside down. אוקיי, okay, and then you need to, 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 to move, turn, turn it back. But the thing is that for, for בעל תשובה, for a person that comes from far, everything you're going to offer to him, he will jump on it and he will be very excited because he knows that he doesn't know anything, so he'll be very happy. A person that is dati, that is from, from birth or from, from habit, it's a, it, it's a, for him it's a, it's a problem. Because he doesn't know how to, like, he's inside of, of certain prison that he used to, and he thinks that spirituality, and he feels religious, and he keeps Shabbat, and, but he doesn't have no real communication, no connection. Who gets more points? Points. Who gets more credit? So, so the verse is saying, "Kefum tsara agra." Corresponding to the effort, you'll be rewarded. Means, if now you will see an elephant that takes a a, a car on his back, you will be impressed and you say, "Okay, but." Okay, it's, a, an, it's an elephant. It's a, it, it won't be such a big deal. But if you will see a small tiny ant that takes a peanut on her back, you, you will be overwhelmed. Wow. When you are weak, when you are weak and you're putting so much effort, so you're, gonna, you, you, you're making more effect in the eyes of Hashem than if you're strong. And it all depends on your effort. A very powerful person that will give, the, the a powerful person that will give all of the effort and will put 100% effort will be equal to a very weak person that will put 100% of his effort. The level is set by the effort, by the ishtadlut, by how much you give and sacrifice. But as a father, you have children, right? Yes, yes thank God. So, can you differentiate between the love from one child from another? First of all, because that everyone are different, so your love to them is also different. You cannot, I cannot say more or less. I'm ready to die for each and every one of them. So how can you say? You cannot estimate. But it's different. You, you, can like, uh, you can like that person because he's funny, and you're going to like that person because he's very deep, and he thinks, and he's serious. And another person, because he's so sharp and... and, and you, you will see the qualities of that person and you will be related to him by those good points that he has. So Hashem Ibarach, he loves us all. He loves us all. Exactly. No matter what, if we're bad, we're good. I think that, I think that, I don't know why, but I think he loves you. I don't know why, but I think he loves, I think he loves you more. He does. I think, because you're very special, you understand? You're a special kid. <laughs> My mother told me that. <laughs> okay. Machloket. I never heard about that machloket. You want to hear what I heard? It's a machloket. You, it's a, it's written as machloket. I don't know. Machloket. It's two. Not as a machloket. It's two separate entities. Okay. In other words, there's, been, there's a place for the Baalei Teshuvah and there's a place for the Tzadikim. So I heard two opinions on that. First of all, the, the verse is saying that Bemakom she Baalei Teshuvah omdim, ain't Tzadikim gmurim yecholim lamod. That in a place of Baalei Teshuvah that they're standing, it's their level, even complete righteous people can't stand in that place. So I heard one opinion that it's because of the stink. The righteous people cannot stand the stink of the Bala Tshuva, so they can't stand That's over them. A That's a joke. That's an opinion. A very righteous man told that joke. So we need to work on our, on our cleaning, you know, on our smell. It's okay. But that's not the real meaning of the verse. The verse is saying to us, that's the only way for the contradiction to come. Because the truth is, I'll give you an example. If now you will see a person that he keeps Shabbat, he is a from from birth, he was all of his life he kept Shabbat. So now, at, 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 at Friday afternoon, he doesn't have a Yetzirah to drive to the beach 
and to go hang out with his friends. And after the seuda, he doesn't have that crazy stress for a cigarette. And it's Shabbat, you know. He, he grew up like that, that he keeps Shabbat, and Shabbat is uh, the seventh day, and you keep it, and, and, and he doesn't have no problem. But about Shuva, in that same Shabbat, he is, a, he is losing his mind. Every bike that he's driving is checking, who is he, what's going on, and he hears what messages, he forgot to turn off his phone, so who is calling and who is messaging, everything moves in Shabbat. So, which of them is putting more effort in Shabbat? I will say that the Baal Tshuva, he is also keeping Shabbat and he's also not violating Shabbat. A religious person is just keeping Shabbat. He doesn't have the Yetzirah, he doesn't have the desire to break Shabbat. Shabbat? What are you talking about Shabbat? You're going to do something in Shabbat? You're going to drive to the sea in Shabbat? What are you going? It's not an option. But the Baal Tshuva that spent half of his life in, Sh in, in the sea, for him Shabbat is, is, is a burden. For him Shabbat is an effort. And from that place to find the pleasant of Hashem and to enjoy in Shabbat and to sing in Shabbat, that's a very high level that another person will be used to it. And like we said before, Kefum Tzara, the reward is according to the effort and not according to the level that you achieve because you can... Exactly. exactly. And especially in the mind of the Creator that that He looks at your intention, at your heart. So there is no doubt that in that place that Baal Tshuva are standing, righteous people cannot stand because they never experienced that war that we experience. I don't. I explain to me why. Explain to me why. Maybe a different angle. Just that. Well. Uh, Bhagavad Gita, he, when he did the sin, right, he had to do the Tikkunim. When he became Bhagavad Gita, so he went through those stages to come to that stage, right? Versus the Tzaddik, who his whole life got to, to, to that level, he's, he's, and though it's not, not that I'm taking away from the Bhagavad Gita, or, or vice versa, from the Tzaddik, I'm just saying it's a different what did you say yeah, sound from 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 what what did you say for me it sounds like lack of justice it's not fair so why that you will be born in Miami I will born in Tel Aviv and he will have the marriage you born in in a fruit so he's gonna have to come back home. if I said let's say now that you have a soldier that is a genius okay right. and that soldier he's got clean uniform and he is coming every day, serving in an office with a computer. He's a very smart person, works in uh, whatever he does in the army. Now you have another soldier that his clothes are filthy and torn, and he came back from the war, and he's wounded, and his face are not clean. So can you, can you say that they are both are equal? We came out of the darkness. We came out of the war that regular righteous person, clean person, will never experience. If you will took, I'll take you and I'll give you another example. If you will take a chassid, a bachur yeshiva, that sits every day and learn Torah, and take him Sunday to the beach, put him in the middle of the beach, Sunday afternoon, put him in the beach, chassid, talmid yeshiva, every day eight, 12 hours, gemara, Four hours, Shulchan Aruch. Put him now in the beach, Sunday afternoon. Okay? Now, take him back from the beach to the yeshiva. I want to see what will happen to him in the next couple of months. After three, four months, he's out of kolel. He's out of the yeshiva. Why? Because that interruption, that thing that he saw, take him to a forest party. One time, give him 10, ten lot trip, one time, let him, let him take LSD, one time acid, and then bring him back to the yeshiva. Okay, put <laughs> on that, it's written, Kol ba'ea lo yeshuvun. People that came to that place cannot come back. But he was righteous. He never touched his place. He never looked at women. He never saw no porn. He never did anything. He never did nothing. He was clean. He ate only kosher, chalab Israel, everything clean. But now one time in the beach killed him. 
One time in a party, killed him. One hour in, in Miami or in Tel Aviv, killed him. That's it. He's done. He's finished. Now, take a person like me that spent half of his life in the beach. What can you offer me that I haven't tried? And now just give me the opportunity to go back to Beit Midrash. You can't stop me from running to Beit Midrash. So I think that I'm much stronger than him. But, yeah. You're right after. are heroes. People are no, carrying no, scars the and bleeding is, wounds the and keep is, on marching I'm toward the Shaman. Of the Gibbul, of the Gibbul Shaman, the Shaman, the Shaman, the Shaman, the Shaman, the Shaman, the Shaman, I, I don't know about I I don't know about lifetimes. If you put lifetimes into that uh, into that aspect, so we believe in it. But if now we're going to start talking about lifetimes, so then you cannot estimate anything. You cannot judge because that righteous man maybe he was about to in a different lifetime, and now that. But Shuba, he was righteous in a different right. time. So, so the there is no argument on that. On that so you must put one in front of the other. Bal Shuba or a tzaddik. Oh, I would put my voice for sure on the Bal Shuba. <laughs> Why on the Bal Shuba? Because he got the answer. Bal Shuba, he got the answer. We're all looking for an answer. Everyone wants an answer. So go to the one that owns the answer, to the Bal Shuba, that he owns the answer. Ask him a question, he's going to answer you. That's about you. He owns the answer. Bechavod, it's your turn. Now you ask your question. No. Still, still thinking. Good. In the end, it will be the strongest one. You'll see. Bechavod, you want to ask something? Anyone have any questions? That's the humble. Let's hear from uh, the back row, from the bleachers. Any topics? Any topics? Bleacher creatures. Any topics? Sandy, what happened? You actually had like a million questions. Come on, Sandy. Let's try it tonight, huh? It's a different question. Oh. Okay, so on that question that I asked you before, I asked what do you think? That uh, if my, what do you think that will happen when Mashiach will come? If Mashiach will be from one of the groups, if Mashiach will be Ashkenazi or if he will be Sfaradi, well, he if he, Let's say that he came from one of those groups. Let's say that he... We don't know who he will be. He will be one person. Okay, so that person got a house, he's got parents, he's got a family, some kind of community. He can be a Baal Shuba, he can be a from, from birth. He will be someone. So I'm asking, if he will come from one of those groups, so I think that it's a very hard thing will be to fix his friends, to fix his community. How are you going to save his community? They will be so pri proud, they will be so arrogant that Mashiach came out of them that it will be very hard to fix them. That's my question. So what that I think that the answer is that Mashiach will have to be someone that doesn't have no tag, like those Baalechu, that doesn't have no label. He will have to be someone that all of the rabbis will get heart attack from seeing that that's Mashiach. No way! It cannot be him! It cannot be him! It must be something like that. Because when Mashiach will come, he will have to humble everyone. Even the, even the highest mountains, even the biggest rabbis will have to humble themselves to Mashiach. Could it be that the world reaches a point at that time where it's, there's so much unity that these these won't be even factors. I want point. to see... Because isn't that the whole point of Mashiach, want, where there's Akhtud and... Let's, and let's say that Mashiach, let's say that now we're talking about an 18 years old Yemenite from Rosh Ha'ayn and his Mashiach, and tell that to your friends in Flatbush, the, the ones that, the, 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 the Ger Hasidim, that Mashiach is a Temani ben Shmona Asre. Not that way. And now tell the other, tell the, the, do the opposite. Tell the Moroccans one that Mashiach is not Marokai. Moroccans think that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he was Moroccan. They think that Rabbi Meir Balanesi was Moroccan. You cannot tell them that Mashiach won't be Marokai. What are you going to do? Everyone got, comes with their opinion, with their desire that Mashiach will come from their group and they're sure that their group is the best. Ashkenazim. Svaradim, Marokaim, Tunisaim, everyone. So from that you learn that the problem is the arrogant and not the group. 
the people that are arrogant are arrogant because that they are arrogant and not because that they are or Sfaradim or Ashkenazim. If that person that now thinks that he's the best because he's Litvish, if you would make him Sfaradik, he would be proud of him being Sfaradik. Why? Because he's got his ego. The thing is that Mashiach will have to come from a place of real unity, really to be connected to everyone and that everyone will be humbled by him, that everyone will realize that he is better than them. Because when Mashiach will come, if Mashiach will be part of some group of a certain community, that community is lost. They won't be able to, to receive his face, to, to receive from him. They will be so arrogant, so... so. How is he going to identify himself? Mashiach? So, I... Uh, no. Baruch Hashem, because I met many like those. More, more than donkeys, more than donkeys that speaks. I met people that thought that they are Mashiach. Unfortunately, the gift that we received from heaven is the fact that the verse is saying that Eliyahu and Navi will come and he will tell us who Mashiach is. So we're waiting for Eliyahu to come and to tell us. So if someone comes to you and tells you, listen, my friend, I trust you, I'll tell you the truth, only between you and me, I am Mashiach, so don't buy that. They need to, to wait that Eliyahu and Avi will come and will blow the shofar, the Kabbalah shofar, the Lord of Eretel. And after he will blow that shofar, he will de declare who Mashiach really is, and then everyone will follow Mashiach. After, it's in the end of the days of Mashiach. In the 40 days of Mashiach, Mashiach will still be hidden, and will reveal himself slowly, slowly in days of Mashiach to people. People will follow him because they will love him. People will follow him because they will relate to him. They will feel close to him. He's an amazing person. But they won't know that he's Mashiach. Only when Eliyahu and Avi will come and say, that's Mashiach, my assumption is that even he will not going to know that he is Mashiach until Eliyahu and Avi will say he's Mashiach. Because he will be so humble not to have it even in his mind that he can be Mashiach. He won't know. He won't know. What do you want to, Max, you had a question? Yeah, I did have a question. So before you touched on how somebody that grows up religious their whole life, that, you know, they're very good, they're religious, but they have that shelter where they're not used to, um, like, for example, somebody else that grew up not religious, right? So they're used to those things and they can overcome when they see, you know, those things. You gave that example of the guy who goes to the beach and then one little misstep in that guy's life could lead him down a pit, right. you know, on the pit. So what do you suggest for people within a community that, you know, everybody grows up religious and, you know, but you have that shelter on the community. And now, you know, one little misstep for a guy that's, you know, going strong for 30, 40, 50 years, one little thing could change his whole life. So obviously it's much easier for a person that's gone through these things, you know, and had a regular life. What do you suggest for, for them to do? So the mistake is very very deep the mistake that caused that problem is very very deep and um, and basic and the solution for it must also come from a very deep understanding of the person the thing is that people in the religious world they are so much into succeeding and doing wonderful things for hashem that they think, and maybe many rabbis are also mistaken on that, to tell you that your success depends in how early you're going to wake up in the morning, in how many pages of Gemara you're going to finish a day, in how late you're going to take out Shabbat, in all of those things. And then you will think to yourself, that you are the one that brings yourself closer to Hashem. That's the mistake. The fact is that you can see the face of Hashem, you can have faith in Hashem, you can have some understanding in Hashem, only when Hashem reveals His face to you. Only when Hashem reveals His kindness on you and open for you the opportunity to learn and to feel and to pray and to have a heart and to have an intention, then you can feel. You can see not because that you have eyes, you can see because Hashem turned on the light. You can have the same holy eyes, strong, healthy eyes, in a dark room. You won't see one inch in front of your eyes. Why? Because there's no light. 
your eyes won't help you in the darkness. You need Hashem to illuminate that you will be able to see. So yes, Hashem gave you talents, Hashem gave you wisdom, gave you family, support, whatever, community, religious world, great. But still, you must remember, and that's the hard part, that it's all a gift of loving kindness of the Creator. A loving kindness that reveals itself to you. A grace, a matat chesed, kind act of mercy, of charity. So people, when they will realize and understand that everything that they have, they received it from heaven, even if they will fail, they won't be confused by that. They won't fall. Because if I failed after 30 years of guarding my eyes and now I saw something wrong, so it hurts my arrogance, my pride. So I'm going to lose my mind because of that. But if I know that every day that I cross healthy and, and holy, it's a miracle, it's a gift from heaven. So if I will fail, I'll just do tshuva. I'm going to come back to Hashem and I'll say, okay Hashem, thank you for reminding me exactly who I am and where am I coming from. And thank you for your kindness to wake me up so that I won't cross my life in sleep. And, and you wake me up to be humble again and to call you again. And not to think that I owe something, that I own something. Just to know that it's all from you. So I think that's the solution. To teach people... Do you think it's okay that you have that mindset? Or do you do it? It's, um, There is only one solution to all of our Avonot. The thing is, so there are people that will try to take advantage of that gift. Okay, you know what, I, I'll, I'll sin and then I'll do tshuva. But on that it's written, They won't let him do tshuva. He, they, will block, they will block his path. If a person is doing that, from if he's doing it from bad intention, Correct. he's trying to take advantage of that opportunity, they're going to stop him. But, right. but, but, the great thing here in this thing as well is that if a person now made a mistake, he sinned, he slipped, he failed, now it's written that if he will fail again, he won't feel the, the sin anymore. He will start sinning in the third and fourth time like it's, uh, it's okay to sin like that. He won't feel it. The reason for that is that he didn't do tshuva between the first time to the second. Why? Because after you do tshuva, you erase the first one. And then when the second will come, and it will come, it will be the first one for you again. Because you erase the first one, you're always in the first and you won't reach the second. A person that is doing tshuva is cleaning his days all of the time and he's always going with a clear pair clean. Of what? Of forgetting or to do tshuva? To do tshuva? Uh, it won't you can say it now you can say and you can use that argument in a conversation but in the end of the day if you will check yourself you're going to see that you're just going to the beach and you're not doing tshuva at all you're just going and going and going and going and not doing tshuva at all the facts will show that you're not doing tshuva so hopefully it's going to wake you up to start doing tshuva again if you made a sin once and then did it again, you won't go and do tshuva on it in the third time. That's a fact. That's a rule of life. Right. So if you <laughs> try, so if you do tshuva on the first time, if you're going to do tshuva on the yeah. first time, so the second time that you will fail, you will feel bad with yourself and it's going to wake you up to go and do tshuva again. And you're going to say to Hashem, Hashem, how can it be that I'm failing? You'll still be close. You'll still be close. You won't be distant. You have the power. You have the... <laughs> can I... You have the power for another story? Yes. Okay. There, is, there was a person that his job was to clean offices. He was cleaning offices. That's his job. Uh, every morning he would wake up very early, coming to the building, getting inside, cleaning the office. After two hours, the people, workers are coming and working and everything was great. 
Now that person came at 5 a.m. to his place and he sees a mess. It was 4th of July, crazy party, everyone celebrated till late. And he was very upset, very angry. They threw up the food and, and liquors and everything and bags all around and chairs and tables upside down. But it's his job and he's got two hours to clean the mess or else he will be out, out of the door. So he worked and he was very angry and upset and cleaning and putting everything in place and putting new bags in the, in the garbage and everything. After one hour, sweat and upset, the office was clean, he was okay. He went, sat in his small uh, room, fell asleep in that small room, put everything aside, woke up, opened his eyes after five minutes, went out from his room and suddenly sees everything is upside down. Same thing, all of the table on the floor, the, the chairs upside down, the bags and food. He said, what's going on? Is it a, is it a joke? Is it a hidden camera? Are you laughing at me? And he's cursing and angry, looking at the watch. He's got 55 minutes. Man, you don't have time. Okay, he starts running. After 30 minutes, 35 minutes, he finished cleaning all of the office, everything back in place. And he sweat and upset and angry and cursing those workers and whatever. And every blessing that he can take out of his mouth go to that small room, close his eyes, dead tired, he's got another 25 minutes to rest before he needs to open the office, open his eyes after five minutes, go out of the room, everything a mess. He doesn't know what to do, he's got 20 minutes left, if the boss will come and will see the office like that, he's lost his job, he's unemployed, what he gonna do? He have to clean, can't even express his sorrow, mute, can't, can't say anything, doesn't have time for anything, running, pale, doesn't have time to sweat, cleaning everything, fixing everything. After 15 minutes, he finished cleaning everything. With no breath, he walks to that small room and he saw that he made a mistake. Instead of resting every time in his small room, he took a nap in the elevator. And it took him to the second floor and then to the third. And he's cleaning one floor after the other. That's the story. He cleaned three floors until now. For him, it was the same experience every time because he's not realizing that Hashem Barach, when you go to sleep and you wake up in the next day, it's a new world. It's a different world. And even if you think, oh, I messed up again and again and again and again, it's not the same world. It's not the same place, it's not the same people, it's not the same sparks. Even inside of you, particles of your spirit, of your nefesh, of your soul are changing all of the time. And you are not in the same situation ever. And you're just fixing and fixing. And there is one person that need to fix in Shlom Bayit, peace with his wife. And he will have many arguments that will look the same, similar. Until you will complete that tikkun, you will come day after day, day after day to the same point until you're going to fix it. One person got issue with his mornings, one person got issue with, with drugs, everyone got some issues and someone else got all of the, the bouquet and he needs to work on all of those issues. Great, but it's not the same place and it's not the same time and it's not the same situation even if it looks the same. Yes. Um, so, is it true that Hashem is more and more hidden until the time of Mashiach? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I know that Hashem Barach is revealing Himself and exposing Himself while we are suffering from darkness that was never here before. Yeah, I long time. We got, we got the. On, you know, I think, I think that most of the things are happening <laughs> in the same time. It's like it's getting darker and darker, close to sunrise, and then suddenly the sun rises and, and, and the dawn is coming. So it's like it's darkest before dawn, but then it's still night and, and, and light and darkness are playing in the same place. So I think that we are now in that uh, twilight zone that the suns are, are switching and you can see so much light in the same time that you can see a lot of a lot of darkness. I have a question. Please. 
Um, I noticed it with, with many different rabbis or even many different mentors or people that you look up to or people that you strive to be like, right? Or that you learn from, that whoever you ask anything to, they will tell you something, they will tell you something from their experience that worked for them, you know, that, 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 that's good for them. And even if you try to follow one person, this person I love, over time you can find faults in that person that you looked up to. And you feel bad. This is the person I, I looked up to. I found, I found faults in him. Right. I don't want to be like that fault in him. Mm -hmm. you know. And then sometimes you are lost. Who do I listen to? Where do I go? Right. Your head can spin around in a circle. Yes, that's, uh, that's why people are buying spinners. <laughs> but, um, but I'll tell you. Um, I think that you're more than right and many people are suffering from that and the only solution is to try to find yourself in that journey of coming closer to Hashem. Avraham was serving Hashem Barach in Midat Chesed, in kindness, but Yitzchak, his son, that it was obvious that Yitzchak will follow after his father and he was actually doing the best that he could, but he went in a totally different path. He went in Gvura, in power, in judgments. He went big vura, Yitzchak big vura. And Yaakov, tell Yaakov, okay, Yaakov, you have two amazing options. Go after your father, go after your grandfather, choose the path. And he chose to go in Tiferet, in glory, in beauty, praising Hashem and being happy and, and being Tamim, a different path. So how can it be? Why are you not following the footsteps of your father, your ancestors? So he did. How? How did he, if he was different than them, so how did he follow them completely? He learned from his father how to be himself. That his father became him, himself. He found his true self and he was serving Hashem from his heart. And he realized, okay, I need to do the same thing that my father did. My father went to find himself. Lech lecha. Hashem said to Abraham, Lech lecha. Go into yourself. Go to yourself. Find yourself. To the land that I'm going to show you, go into the unknown, go look for yourself, find your true self. So I need to do the same, Yaakov said, Yitzchak said. I need to find my connection to the Creator. And then you're not imitating no one. You learn from the experience of that person how you also going to put all of the effort and, and going to make the biggest ishtadlut and going to do the best that you can, like that he did, but in your place, in your family in your house, in your community, in your company. You need to find your true self in life. Thank you very much. Thank you. In this world, in this period of time, we have a mission. What's the mission? The mission is only not to forget the Creator, to remember that it's all He, never to fall in the trap of all of those coverings, of all of those husks.